And we typically use the letter R to you know, designate that we're talking about a resistor. Uh, and so this symbol, the electrical circuit symbol for that, the symbol for a resistor is given right here, and it just sort of looks like a scrunched up wire like that, and you can sort of think of it as um, this resistor, what it's basically going to do is uh, it's going to resist the flow of electrons through the, through, through the resistor. What, it's going to constrict it. It's going to uh, try to stop it, so to speak. So the little scrunched up wire is sort of trying to tell you that it's, preventing, uh, it's, it's presenting an obstacle to the current, and that's kind of why it's all bunched up and, and uh, you know, kind of causing it to kind of do that. Now, of course, it, the resistor is not constructed with up and down wires. This is just the, the electrical symbol for it. All right, so if we have a circuit with this little element here we call a resistor, then we say it has a value of R uh, ohms, which you might see, or you will see, written as the, um, the letter omega right there. It's a unit of resistance. If we were taking a real circuits course, I'd go into why we're labeling it ohms and all that. It's not that important now. All I'm trying to tell you is if you have a resistor in a circuit, it has a value of R ohms. It could be 5 ohms. could be 17 ohms. could be you know 2 ohms or something like that and a resistor constricts and tries to, to prevent the flow of current. The higher the value of the resistor, the more it's trying to prevent that current from flowing through the wire there. All right, the other thing we have, or another thing we have, is called an inductor. Okay, this is called an inductor. This is something that you may not learn until you get into a circuits course or maybe a physics course, or if you have an interest in it and read a few books, it'll talk about inductors as one of the, the primary circuit elements. And for historical reasons, we use the letter L to, to denote an inductor when we're talking about inductance. We don't really want to use I for inductor because later on, we're going to, I'm going to tell you in a second, uh, I is used for current. And there's a historical reasons why I is used for current. So some of these things you have to kind of learn. You, know, you would think you would use C for current because it's C. You would think you would use I for inductor because it's I. But there's a lot of history behind this, so it doesn't always follow that convention. But R does mean resistor, and that's kind of easy to remember. So for an inductance, we call it, the symbol, the electrical circuit symbol for that is like a coiled up wire. So see, they look quite different. And so what we say is we have a value of L, and the unit is Henry's. And you might even see it H, abbreviated H for Henry's. All right, so we have two primary circuit elements, the resistor, which constricts the flow of electric current through the element here and we have the inductor and there's a lot of theory here that I'm not really going to have time to tell you but basically this inductance um, it sort of presents a resistance to current but only if the current is oscillating back and forth so it's very selective an inductor really doesn't do anything if you have a constant current current flowing through it because it's just basically a coil of wire this is actually one of those cases when the symbol really does look a little bit like the real thing. An inductor really is a coil of wire. Um, and so what's happening here is when you run this electric current through the inductor, you have a magnetic field that's formed around the inductor, and it kind of concentrates the magnetic field uh, here around the inductor. So if you have a constant current, the current's just going to sail right on through because it's a coiled up wire. I mean, there's nothing else there except a coil of wire, so the current's going to go through. But if you start changing the current up and down, back and forth, like something that comes out of your wall, AC is what we call it, alternating current. Then what happens is this current starts oscillating back and forth through here when you put AC on it. And then that causes, when you do this, the magnetic field to get bigger and smaller and bigger and, and stronger and weaker and stronger and weaker. And when that happens, then you start to see this inductance affect the circuit because what you basically have is a coil sitting inside of a magnetic field that's changing all the time. And so you, you end up getting an effect on the circuit here and it, it starts to affect it. So I'm not going to get into how it affects it. Uh, we'll get into that in just a few more minutes. But I do want to tell you that these are the two guys we're going to learn about in this section. We're going to construct a circuit with these guys and use a differential equation to find out what's happening. The first guy is a resistor. It resists any and all current flow that goes through it. An inductor, you can sort of think as a, as a resistor, but only really affects or has any sort of uh, effect in, when the current is changing up and down. And that's because the magnetic field coming back and forth through the inductor. If you have a constant current, then the current's just going to sail right on through this coil. All right. So what do we do? Now, there's also something called a capacitor, by the way, uh, that that is you know, one of the three primary circuit elements. 
but we're not going to study it in this section because when you start introducing an inductance and a capacitor in the same circuit, then the differential equation gets a little bit more complicated than we're really prepared to solve. But if we limit our problem to inductors and resistors, then we can solve some of these equations. So as we get down the road into higher order differential equations down the road, we'll do probably some more complicated circuits so that you have the tools to solve, you know, to get the answer. All right. Now, what do we do with this information? We're obviously going to, you know, to, um, to create a circuit, uh, which is a, a path that we allow the current to flow. So just to kind of give you something for illustration purposes, let's go ahead and draw a simple little circuit. In fact, this is going to be a circuit we're going to solve here in a second. Uh, let's look at this guy. Let's say we have a resistor like this, and it's connected in series with an inductor. And series just means they're connected one after another. It doesn't matter that it's bent down like this. It's just one little wire like this, and it goes all the way back around. And here I'm going to put a circle here. And this guy, we're going to say, this is the voltage as a function of time, plus and minus. You can sort of think of this as a battery, but it, we're doing the general case here. So this battery is allowed to oscillate back and forth like what might come out of your wall. Um, or since it's a function of time, it could be a constant voltage. Um, it, v of t is whatever we want it to be. If we put a nine volt battery here, then it's gonna be nine volts constant, no changes. If we put it up to our wall, it's gonna be 120 volts oscillating back and forth at 60 times per second, because that's what comes out of our wall. But in general, we're just gonna put V of t because right now we're not really doing anything, but just, just some general stuff. So here we have uh, a resistor, and here we have an inductor. Now I'm not even gonna put any values here. In reality, this could be five ohms and this could be 10 Henry's or something like that. But what I want to do is put it here so that we can talk about what I'm gonna call something that you have probably studied before, at least heard of if you've taken physics, and that's Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff. And specifically, there's really two of Kirchhoff's laws that I need to at least sort of tell you about. The first one, we're gonna call it the current law. All right, now in your book or in another physics book or something or a circuits book, it might be called Kirchhoff's first law, Kirchhoff's second law. It doesn't really matter. There's two Kirchhoff's law. I'm going to call this one the current law. What it basically says is that when you have, uh, it, you can formulate it many different ways, but for this particular circuit uh, here, that's a very simple one loop circuit. What Kirchhoff's law tells us for this drawing on the board is that the current running around this guy, because see, I've got a current here. I'm going to call it I and the current is the actual electricity running around the circuit here, all right? And these circuit elements are causing the current to, you know, come to a certain value because we've got all these things in the way. Um, Kirchhoff's current, current law basically says that the current in every part of the circuit must be the same. So let me write that down. So the current, I'm gonna put capital I here, but it's, it's the same as little i here. Um, the current must be the same everywhere in a single loop circuit. Now, if I have a multi-loop circuit, like if I have another loop over here, another loop over here, well then I would formulate and write Kirchhoff's Law a little bit differently, but this is not a circuits class, so I'm just gonna just sort of show you based on the problem we're gonna work. This means that the current in right here, the current right here, the current right here, the current right here, everywhere in this single loop, the current is the same value. And that has to be the case because it's connected physically from one part to the next with a single wire. Now you've got these things in the way, but the electrons are running around in a big circle. So it makes sense that the current, which is basically the amount of electrons flowing, has to be the same everywhere we look in this loop. It has to because they're physically connected in one, one loop together. So another way to write this is the current in the resistor is equal to the current in the coil because they're connected together. I'm going to use this a little bit later and it kind of, it, it follows a little bit of common sense, but if you've never studied circuits at all, it might be a little bit, you know, new to you. So we're just going to write it down, make it absolutely clear. The current everywhere is I, whatever I comes out to be. All right. Let's look quickly at Kirchhoff's voltage law. Mathematically is probably the easiest way to write this down. 
Kirchhoff's voltage law, again, when referencing this particular circuit on the board, because when you really write Kirchhoff's voltage law, it's written in terms of a general circuit that could be anything. Here I'm giving you this circuit. This is not a circuits class. I'm just trying to get you enough to understand so we can solve this problem. So when I write Kirchhoff's law in the context of this circuit on the board, then what it means is that the um, that basically the voltage source over here, this guy, is going to be equal to the sum of the voltage drop across these two guys when you add them together. So V across the resistor plus V across the coil or the inductor is another way to look at it. So that may be a little bit of a surprise to you if you haven't studied circuits at all. What this basically means is, okay, let's say this is a 9-volt battery. I have a circuit. I'm building, everybody's built a little circuit at some point in their youth, or at least played around with one. Let's say you have a nine volt battery. So this is nine volts. This is the source. That is the source of the energy and the power in the circuit. It's the only thing supplying any electrons to the whole circuit. And it's right here, nine volts. So what's gonna happen is these electrons are gonna go out, and as they encounter these circuits elements, if you got a meter out and you measured the voltage drop, the voltage across this resistor, you would get a number in volts. And then, at the same time, if you can measure the voltage drop across this, you would get a number in volts. These voltage drops are not because these, this, these circuit elements are producing any electricity. I mean, they're passive elements. They're not producing anything. But when the current flows through them, um, because of the circuit theory that I don't have really the means to, to, to get into a ton of detail, there is going to be a voltage drop across this resistor just because the current is going through it. All right? The current is going through it. And when it gets over to here, then the, uh, there will be a voltage drop accordingly over here. Now, what would those voltage drops be? The mathematical voltage drop across a resistor, let me switch colors over here, across a resistor is going to be V, the voltage drop across a resistor is going to be the current flowing through the resistor times the value of the resistor. V is equal to IR, that's called Ohm's law. All right, so if I knew how much current was flowing through the circuit and I put a meter here, I times R is gonna give me how many volts I've got here. Now this inductor is sitting over here and it's going to have a voltage drop across it as well. And this voltage drop is a little bit more complicated. It's actually L, the value of the inductance, times DI dt, L DI dt, the change of the current. Now think about this for a second. The reason this voltage is proportional to the change of the current flowing through there is exactly what I told you in words a few minutes ago. If there is no change in the current, if it's just a constant nine volt battery supplying a constant current that's not changing through here, then there's really not gonna be anything, any obstacle presented by this inductance. So the voltage is going to be zero because the change of current is going to be zero. So there's no voltage drop across it. But if I hook an alternating current, a current source that's swinging back and forth here, the current is going to be going up and down, up and down, up and down through this guy. And because it's a coil, if you think back to your physics, for those of you who ta are taking physics now or have taken physics, if you have a coil and you're sticking a current through it and it's alternating back and forth, the magnetic field, just like I told you a minute ago, is gonna be getting bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. And when this magnetic field that's generated interacts with the coil, you're going to get a voltage that's going to be produced. In other words, it's going to try to fight that magnetic field with the voltage. And it's gonna be proportional to the change of the current, how fast the current is changing. So that's about as much circuit theory I really wanna get into. If I were teaching a whole course, we would get into a whole lot more of this, but just suffice to say, this is the circuit we're going to solve. We have a resistor and we have a re an inductor. And if you didn't understand anything else I am saying, then just believe this. The voltage across this resistor is the current times the resistance value that we, we give it. The voltage across this inductor is the inductance value times the rate of change of the current. The rate of change is, it's not proportional to the current, it's proportional to how fast the current is changing. That's what that voltage is. Kirchhoff's law says the current at any given time is gonna be the same everywhere in this loop. And the other Kirch Kirchhoff's law says that if this measures nine volts across this battery or whatever it is I have, then the sum of whatever these voltage drops are must add up to nine because that's what it's connected to. It's connected to a certain value. If it's connected to an alternating source, it doesn't matter. The, at any given time, the voltage across here plus the voltage across here is going to give me the voltage value of the source. So that's quite a bit of um, pre-work 
in order to even just get to be able to solve the problem. Now what we're going to do now is redraw this circuit and actually put some values to it and take a look at it. And I think you'll understand a little bit better. So let's say we have some voltage source. We'll call it V of T. And it's connected to a resistor, which is connected to an inductor, back to the source. Just like we had before, no changes at all. All right, now this value of resistance, we're going to say R is equal to two ohms. It's a value. You can go buy it at the, at the, you know, at the store and come home with a two ohm resistor. This inductance over here is equal to four Henry's. Same thing, you can go to the store and order a coil that was an actual inductor and it has a value of four Henry's. And for this problem, let's go ahead and say that the this is in general V of T, a, a function of time, voltage swinging as a function of time. But for this problem, let's say it's a constant. Let's say it's a constant 12 volts. So we've simplified things and so, sort of hopefully um, made it a little bit concrete in your mind. We have 12 volt battery here connected to a two ohm resistor, connected to a four Henry um, inductor, and it's just connected in a single loop. All right, now let's say there's some initial condition. Let's say there's some initial condition. At time is equal to zero, at the moment I start observing this, let's say I have three, a value of three for the current. Now, I haven't even told you this, the unit of current is amps. I know a lot of you have already heard of the term amps. That's how many electrons, um, without getting into detail, it measures how many electrons are moving through the circuit every second. All right, so this is the current going through here. We're gonna call it I. Now, this is the initial condition. So at zero, we have three amps flowing through. We have all the information we need to try to solve this guy. All right, so what do we wanna do? We basically, you know, we have a, well, we can probably even make this a little bit more clear. We could put a switch in here, let's say. Let's put a switch so that at time zero, see nothing's connected because I have the switch open. Now at time zero, I close the switch, time starts, Current is three amps, that's my initial condition, at time is equal to zero when the switch closes, and what I wanna do is find what I is doing every moment after that. So I wanna know I of T is equal to what? That's what I wanna find out. What is I doing as we go off and look five minutes down the road, 10 minutes down the road, or something like that? All right, so what you need to do when you're tackling these circuit problems is you really have to use Kirchhoff's Law. And that's why I introduced it. And we learned that when you have a voltage source like this, the voltage source is going to be equal to the sum of the voltage drops going around this circuit like this, right? And that's because this is the source voltage. These voltage drop across this and this, those are reactionary voltage drops across because the current's going through, but the total voltage, they must add up like this. All right, so what is the voltage across a resistor? We talked about that. Voltage across the resistor is I times R. Voltage across an inductor is L di dt. So if we wanted to write a differential equation, then we, let's just start at this point. Let's say um, I times R plus L di dt is equal to V of T. This is the general differential equation. Now make sure you really understand this. What this is saying is that the voltage drop across this resistor, which is I times R, plus the voltage drop across this inductor, which is L times di dt, is gonna be equal to the voltage across the source, which is V of T. I haven't put any values in. We're just doing it in terms of the circuit. This is a good old fashioned differential equation. We could have just started this problem and I could have just given you this differential equation with some numbers and said solve it. We could have done that you know, a couple sections ago. But Half the challenge in, in the applications is understanding what, you know, why we're, why we're even doing this. Why, why is it useful? So that's why we go through the beginning part. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug in some values of what we have. So R is 2, so we'll call this 2I plus L di dt. L is 4, so it's 4 di dt is equal to V of t, which is over here which is 12. In this particular case, the voltage is not changing with respect to time. It's like we hook a constant battery up. Now, you should get even, be even more comfortable when you see this guy, as far as you can be comfortable with differential equations, because this, I think you can convince yourself, you've been doing problems like this already. I 
we've been using x all, all up until now. All up until now. So we could have you know 2x plus 4 dx dt is equal to 12. And then I could have told you to solve that differential equation. And you would have dutifully gone off and done that. So let's put this guy in sort of standard form. And uh, let's think about how to do it. Now notice that this is a um, non-homogeneous differential equation. In other words, we put everything on one side in terms of i and di dt, and we still have a term on the right. So we're going to label this n for non-homogeneous, right? And what we want to do first is we're going to end up using the uh, variation of parameters method for first order systems, and we talked about that before. When you can write it in this, in this format, you know, something times di dt plus something times i is equal to a number that's called non-homogeneous because we've got something over here on the other side of the equal sign. So we want to solve the homogeneous version. That's the first thing we do when we have an equation that we think we can use variation of parameters. So what is that equation? We're just going to set this equal to zero. So we have 2i plus 4 di dt is equal to zero. This is the homogeneous version. What we're basically going to do if you just recall, is we're going to solve this version of the differential equation, the homogeneous version. We're going to get an answer, and then we're going to let the constant vary. It's called varying the parameter. And we're going to use that to find the, the solution to the non-homogeneous version. All right, so let's go ahead and do that next. We want to look at this and see what we can do with this. This is actually a separable differential equation, if you think about it. So if we move 2i over here, we'll have uh, 4 di dt is equal to negative 2i. And we can divide both sides by 4, so we can sort of put it in sort of standard form and just sort of get rid of the constants. Or we could have done that earlier actually, but let's do it this way. So we have di dt is equal to, we'll divide it out here, so we'll have negative 1 half i. Now I think when you look at something like this, you might be able to convince yourself that you know how to solve that. It's separable. So let's go ahead and work on that. Let's go ahead and work on that. So what we're going to have here, let me just work over here a little bit. We'll move the i and the 2 over here. So if we're going to move the 1 half over here, we're going to basically multiply both sides by negative 2. So on the left, we'll have negative 2. And we're dividing by i, so we'll have 1 over i. And then we'll have di over here is equal to, whoops, not dt, di on the left-hand side, and that's dt. Make sure you understand what's happening here. We're just separating variables. We're taking all everything with regard to i, and we're moving it over here in front of di, and we're taking dt and we're moving it over here. So we multiply by uh, 2 uh, to get, or yeah, we multiply by negative 2 actually, to get negative 2 over here, and then we multiply by dt over here, we divide by i over here. So everything's pulled over to the left, everything's pulled over to the right. The reason we do that is so that we can integrate. And what I'm actually going to do next is draw this guy like this. So we'll have integral negative 2 times 1 over i di is equal to the integral of dt. Make sure you understand that. So we're just integrating both sides, so we're just doing separation of variables. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue over here. So when we look at this guy, we're going to rewrite it. We're going to pull the negative 2 out from the integral. 1 over i di is equal to integral dt. Integral 1 over i is natural log, so we'll have negative 2 times natural log of i equals integral of this guy is t plus a constant. Now, we don't write a constant on both sides. You should be comfortable with this by now. If we put a constant over here, we can just move it over here and, and roll it up together. So we just write the constant in one location. Ultimately, we're trying to solve for i, so let's move 2 back over here. Natural log of i is equal to negative 1 half t plus a constant. We just move the uh, 1 half over there. And then finally, to get i by itself, let me go ahead and switch colors here. To get i by itself, we'll just raise both sides to the power of e. e to the minus 1 half t plus a constant, like that. 
All right, and so this is going to drop out the i. i is going to equal this guy. I'm going to write as e to the power of c times e to the power of negative one half t. You should be comfortable with seeing this. Basically, all we're doing is rewriting this exponent. Since it's a sum in the exponent, we're writing it as multiplication, right? And then finally, in the end, this is e to the power of c. I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to, I'm going to call it now i of t because we know it's function of time. And I'm going to call this number k. It's just a number. k times e to the minus 1 half t. Now I'm going to sort of circle it, but it's not the final answer. This is the solution to the homogeneous version of the differential equation. Let's go back and make sure that we know what that is. The homogeneous version of this equation is this one. It's when we took the original equation that we had and we set the right hand side equal to zero. Now I want to take a second here as a sort of a, um, a intermission, right, because we're halfway through the problem, um, to sort of tell you a little bit about this. What we have here in general is we have a circuit. This side of the equation, the differential equation we wrote, only involves the elements in the circuit, the passive elements. So this part of the equation describes everything over here. It, and the values and the way we set it up describes how that part of the circuit's gonna basically react. And on the other side, we have V of T, which is the source. It's sort of the pump, if you might think of it that way. It's, it's the forcing function is what you really, the word that you'll, you, you really wanna use. And that's equal to 12. So when we, strip away the 12 to solve what we call in these courses the homogeneous version of the equation. When we put it equal to zero, what you're basically doing is setting the source equal to zero. You're taking away the voltage source and you're solving the equation that results. And what you're getting, which is what we just found over here, it's just a solution to the homogeneous version. What we're basically doing right here is figuring out how that circuit is going to respond without an active source in it. All right, and that's sort of like remove the forcing function and then you see how the circuit reacts, how it behaves just because the circuit elements are there. And then later on when we continue the solution, we add the source back in and then we figure out how the circuit behaves when the source is present. And circuit isn't really the best analogy to teach you how it works, but you can definitely think about it in terms of a spring. If you have a block and a spring connected to the wall, right? Um, if I and that spring has a spring constant. That's gonna govern how stiff the spring is, right? So if I pull the block back and I let it go, it's gonna, right? It's gonna go back and forth like that. So if I pull it back and at that moment just let it go, at the moment I let go, that's T is equal to zero. There's no forcing function at that point. The only thing governing the motion of that spring is the spring constant, the friction on the table, the mass of the block, basically and I guess gravity is indirectly uh, in there, but there's no forcing function. So if I pull the spring bracket and let it go, that's like solving a homogeneous equation. It's seeing how the system responds when there's no active input. Yeah, yeah, I pulled it back, I let it go, but at T0, I'm not pushing on it anymore. It's just reacting. Now, if I take another system with a spring and I pull it back and I release it, but I still have a mechanical arm attached to that block, and the mechanical arm is like pushing on it at a certain frequency, right? I'm actively pushing on the system. That's the forcing function. That's continuing to inject energy into the system. So the total solution is really gonna involve how the spring behaves, that's a homogeneous version, plus it's gonna have a component because I'm still pushing on it, and that's, that's sort of like the part that's related to the non-homogeneous thing. So you can sort of, now that you have that in your head, you can look at this and say, well, the solution of this homogeneous system is really telling me how this circuit is going to behave um, if I, I might shoot some current into it, right? Because I am getting a value of current. I might shoot some values, a value of current into it, but then I'm hands off. I'm not gonna touch it anymore. And then I wanna see how that current behaves over time. And you can see that if I just shoot current into this circuit, right? and just let it go, because there's a resistance in there and there's an inductance in there, you can see the current is gonna taper off because this is a constant, and this guy, e to the minus one half t, is just dying off. So as time goes on with no active input, this current is just gonna disappear, and that's exactly what you would expect. If I build a circuit and I shoot some electrons in there and then back off and let it behave and let it react, then it's gonna die off because you, it's got resistance. Everything you build in real life is not perfect. It's, gonna, it's got real resistance, so it's gonna die. All right, so I just wanted to bring that up because it's super important to really understand what these differential equations are doing. When you do a homogeneous deal, when you take the source out, that's what you're doing. You're seeing how the system responds 
with no active input. You stick a source back on the end, you know, pushing electrons in there, then, which is what we're really doing here, then the final solution is going to involve what we call the homogeneous system. That's how the system reacts um, if you don't have an active input, a forcing function. Plus, it's also going to involve another term that we're going to find here in a minute that's going to involve the fact that we've got a source constantly pushing energy into that circuit or into that system. It applies to, to almost all systems in real life. All right, so we've got the homogeneous version. This is how the circuit behaves with, you might think of it as an instantaneous input, but not an active ongoing input. All right, what do we do next? This is variation of parameters method. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend and assume that k is not actually a constant. We're going to assume it varies with a, as a function of time. And we've learned this method before. So we say k is now a function of time, e to the minus 1 half t, right? So we're just going to make this assumption, and we're going to use this to plug it back in and see if it simplifies and makes this, the solution solvable. And so what we're basically going to do is we're going to take it, this, this new solution that we're sort of guessing. So we're going to, let me write this down. I'm going to say we're going to vary parameter k. That's what we're varying. We're going to take the solution now. We're going to stick it into the original differential equation, the entire differential equation, the non-homogeneous with the source attached. All right, so in order to do that, I'm going to need i, but I'm also going to need di dt. So di dt. I need to take the derivative of this, but I've got a function of time times function of time. So you have to use the product rule of derivatives. So it's going to be k of t times the derivative of this, uh, which is going to be negative one half times e to the negative one half t. This times the derivative of this plus this times the derivative of this, but you really don't know what that is, so you just write it as k prime of t. All right, make sure you understand this. We just took the derivative, this times the derivative of this plus this times the derivative of that. All right, now what we want to do is we want to take this information. We want to plug um, i of t, which is this guy right here, into the non-homogeneous equation, which is the original equation that we had. So what is that equation, by the way? Let's write it down again. It's 2 times i plus 4 di dt is equal to 12. So it's 2 times i plus 4 times di dt is equal to 12. So really all we want to do is plug in this value of i uh, into this guy. Okay? So let's do that. 2 times i. So what we're going to have, let me go and switch colors to make this a little bit clear. So we're going to have 2 times i. i is this thing right here. So it's 2 times k of t e to the minus 1 half of t. So we have 2 times i, no problem, plus 4 times di dt. Now we pre-calculated di dt. I did that because I knew the equation involved di dt. So don't forget you have a 4 out here. So di dt is going to be in a giant bracket, and it's this, this mess over here. So you're going to have k of t. Um, times, actually, let me go ahead and re try to save a little bit of space here. Let's rewrite this a little bit. Negative one half, it's going to be negative one half k of t, which is this, times e to the minus one half t. Okay, that's this part, plus this guy, e, let me go ahead and write it as k prime first, k prime of t, e to the minus one half of t, that's this term, close the brackets, and it's going to be equal to 12. Make sure you understand where everything comes from, because if you get lost here, then you're just never going to get anywhere. 2 times i, that's what I have, plus 4 times di dt. di dt is given by this. So if I did everything right, this should be exactly what's inside of here. And it's all equal to 12. That's my uh, differential equation. Okay. Now what I want to do is... All I'm going to do in the next step is distribute this 4 in, and let's see what we have. So let's go up there and do that. 
So when I distribute that 4n, what I'm going to have is 2 times k of t e to the minus 1 half of t minus 2k of t e to the minus 1 half of t plus 4k prime of t e to the minus 1 half t is equal to 12. Now make sure you really get where this is coming from. The only thing that's happened here is this is exactly unchanged. 4 times negative 1 half is going to give me negative 2, so I've got a negative 2 here. 4 times this is going to give me that 4. That's the only thing that's, that's changed. This is the same. I've got negative 2 in front of this term, 4 in front of this term. Everything else is exactly the same. Now here in the variation of parameters is you get this magical cancellation. If you go back to variation of parameters, you'll remember that. This entire term cancels with this entire term. So everything is suddenly a lot easier. What you have left over is 4 times k prime of t times e to the minus 1 half of t is equal to 12. And so in order to solve this guy, what we need to do is solve for k prime of t. So let's solve for that. k prime of t is equal to, we have 12 divided by 4 is going to give us 3. Let's move e to the minus 1 half t over here. Now when we divide, it's going to become e to the positive 1 half t because you can think of it as 1 over e to the minus 1 half t, which flips the sign of the exponent. So here's what we have. Now, in order to find the answer to this lengthy problem, we have to find k of t. So k of t is equal to the integral of 3e to the 1 half t dt. Now this is actually a pretty simple integral to do. Because this is, remember, this is k prime. This is a derivative. So to find k, k of t, we integrate. So what we have here is 3 times, what is the integral here? We have e to the 1 half t. How do you take the integral of e to the 1 half t? Now, if you're not comfortable doing this, if you haven't done this enough times by now, you could set u equal to this exponent. You could do a substitution integral. But when you do it long enough, what you'll realize is that when you're taking uh, integrals like this, the result is going to be 1 over the derivative of the exponent, 1 half. Then it's indestructible. So the integral itself is still e to the 1 half t. And that's going to be plus a constant. Make sure you really get that because I, I didn't really want to skip too many steps here, but you really end up doing so many of these, these integrals, um, it, just, it just becomes so common. So what you end up having is 1 over 1 half gives you 2, right? So you flip that, you get a 2. 2 times 3 is 6. So what we have is 6e to the 1 half t plus a constant. 6e to the 1 half t plus a constant. Okay, so that is the answer of k of t. Just make sure you understand where this integral comes from. We're basically, if you do it by substitution, you're going to get this answer the quick way. 1 over the derivative of the exponent, which is 1 half, times this exponent as it is, just like that. All right, so we found k of t. Now let's go back to our solution. Our solution for i is, because we're varying the parameter right here, i of t is equal to k of t times e to the minus 1 half t. That is what we said the final solution is. Now we have found what k of t is. So we plug k of t into the following thing when we said before that it was going to be i of t was going to be k of t e to the minus 1 half t. And that comes straight off this board. And that was this solution right here that we found. So we're just plugging in for k. So the final answer, well, getting closer to the final answer, is i of t is equal to k of t, which is this guy. So let's go ahead and wrap it up like this. 6e to the 1 half t, this guy, plus this constant of integration, times this, e to the minus 1 half t. All right, so when we multiply this exponential in, i of t is going to equal 6 because e to the 1 half t times this guy, you add the exponents, you're going to get 0, e to the 0 is 1. So all you end up with is 6 here, plus a constant of integration times e to the minus 1 half t. And this is basically the solution. This is the solution to 
the non-homogeneous differential equation, which let's go back to our original problem. It's the solution of this differential equation. The only thing that it's really missing is we have an initial condition that at the time is equal to zero, we have three amps. So because of that, we still have a constant of integration. We have an infinite number of solutions because we have an infinite number of initial conditions. So specifically, this problem gave an initial condition, which was I at zero is equal to three. So that's simple enough. We just put three amps in for I, six plus constant times E to the minus one half at time zero. So we put T is equal to zero. All right, E to the zero is one e to the zero is one. So what we're going to have here is three is equal to six plus this constant. And so this constant, when we move six over here, is negative three. So at the end of the day, I'll write the answer in, why not red? i of t is equal to six plus this constant, which was negative three. So because it's negative three, it's really gonna be minus 3e to the minus 1 half t. This is the final solution of this differential equation. i of t is equal to 6 minus 3e to the minus 1 half t. Now there's a couple things I do want to point out in this problem. And let's look at our solution and really take a look at it. What we have is two parts, and I tried to allude to this earlier. We have sort of a constant part here, plus we have the part that involves this exponential here. Now notice that uh, when we look very far into the future, we send t off into infinity. Then when we send t off into infinity, this guy, this one half e to the minus one half t, when we go to infinity, what we're basically doing is this entire term is gonna drop away. Because as t goes to infinity, you're going to have a really large negative exponent, which is going to drive this whole term down to zero. So when, when t goes to infinity, then i, the current, just goes to a constant 6. So when we send t off to infinity, then the current levels off at 6 amps. So there's some sort of some busy behavior happening in the beginning here, but it all drops off. So because of that, then these things sort of have names that you might see in books. So this might be called, this might be called a transient. You might even see it called a transient solution. And it doesn't mean that it's not important, it just means that it dies off. It doesn't affect anything in the long run. We flip the switch, we close the switch, we send the current through the circuit, and there's some sort of some jitteriness happening in the beginning. When it, things settle out, then this, this is totally not even relevant. It all dies off. Now this guy is what we call typically when you see this happen, and it does happen pretty often in differential equations. This we call the steady state. the steady state solution. And it's steady state because this is what's relevant when you look far and far in the future. So if you were to, um, if you were to plot this function, right, then you would have, let me actually drop it up a little bit like this. Do a coordinate axis, just a quick little plot. Let's do i of t as a function of time. I'm not gonna make it real uh, accurate. I'm just gonna give you a general idea so you can kind of figure this out. So if this is six amps, right? Then what's going to happen here is the solution is telling you if you plot this is this is what you get. It goes up, 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 but then it levels off. It never gets higher than six and as time goes on to infinity, basically you approach six amps. So yeah, in the beginning here, you know, you have some changes that are happening because you turn the, the, the energy on, it goes through the circuit and it goes up like this. Eventually it levels off, so the steady state solution is um, the steady state solution is, is what you have. So it's, it's a good problem, it's a lengthy problem. I'll be honest with you, it's a really lengthy problem, but it's a good problem to have. And the, the thing that you really have to do is just look at it as a loop, Kirchhoff's voltage law. So you have the voltage here plus the voltage here is equal to the voltage of the source. Voltage across the resistor was I times R, so you have two I. The voltage across the inductor is four times di dt, then you, you get that, is equal to the voltage of the source, which is this guy. So here's your differential equation. You look at it, you have some experience now with differential equations. You see that you might be able to solve it by variation of parameters. So you set the um, steady state, or the, the uh, forcing function to zero so that you have the, home, we call it the homogeneous version. Uh, and so you have this guy, you move things over, you see that it's separable, so you get all of the i, i terms on the i side and dt on the other side, so you integrate both sides. And then when we integrate both sides like this, we get a natural log 
and we get a natural log with some stuff on the other side. We raise both sides to the power of e to get i by itself. i becomes this guy, and so we rewrite our constant as a value k, and so we have this guy, we call it the solution of the homogeneous version. Now, if you're doing a spring system or a mixing system, any, almost any kind of system, when you're solving the homogeneous version, what you're doing is seeing how the system responds based on the system itself without any inputs or without any constant ongoing inputs. Like I said, pulling that spring back and letting it go and seeing how it kind of damps out over time. Right? Notice that it does damp out over time, so you know it's going to all disappear eventually. Same thing here with this current. If you, if you put some current in the system and you let it go, it's going to all die out if there's no current continuing to come into the system. That's what this homogeneous solution represents. To continue on, we let this parameter vary as k of t, and we, it's kind of a guess, but it's proven to work in certain forms of equations. So we plug this, di, this, uh, uh, this new i of t with the parameter varied into our original differential equation, which was here. So i comes in uh, here, 2 times i. di dt we need to plug in for. So we calculate di dt, which is a little bit messy, but we do it. We put it in here, and then we distribute everything out. And if you did everything correctly, you must see a cancellation getting rid of like about half of the equation, if you did it all correctly. If you don't get a cancellation here, you've done something wrong. You get this guy, you solve for k prime of t, and you notice, okay, I can integrate this. So then you integrate it, find the value of k of t, which we have as this. Don't forget your constant of integration. And then finally, the solution to our differential equation, the solution to the homogeneous version was given here. We plug in the value of k that we just found, k of t, here. We settle everything out, multiply exponents through. This is the solution to the differential equation. It is the answer. We have an initial condition here, so we solve for that constant by putting at time zero a current, solving for the constant, putting the constant in. And at the end of the day, we really see that there's like two parts of the solution. There's the transient part that dies off, and then there's the steady state part that sticks around forever. And so we would graph it. We can sort of see that graphically there. Uh, there is another circuit problem I want to do, but it's even longer than this one, so I want to put that in its own section. Uh, for now, really absorb and digest what we have here. Believe me, I understand. There's a ton of steps here. Any one of these steps would lead to disaster results if you grew up a sign or if you just get careless. Uh, and believe me, everybody makes those errors. The only defense you have is to go and work as many problems as you can get your hands on and just get practice with it and show as much work as you can because if you make a mistake you'll get credit for what what you you know what you were doing everybody makes mistakes especially on a timed exam just do the best you can uh, i'm jason i hope you've learned something from this i tried to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in addition to the math behind it so that you can kind of get a little bit excited about what you can do here um, we're going to have another problem that's going to look very similar to this except uh, the input voltage is not going to be a constant. So that guy's going to be changing. It's going to, it's going to cause the problem to get a little bit uglier, but it's all doable. If you take each step as one little chunk and one little thing to succeed at, you'll get good at it. I'm Jason. Practice your problems. Keep your chin up. It is a lot of work, but you'll get there with practice. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.